Yes, Mr. Dunn. Uh, may it please, Your Lordships, I appear with Professor George on behalf of the appellant father, who is the gentleman sitting uh, in front of me. Uh, my learned friend, Mr. Tyler of King's Council, and Miss Allman appear on behalf of the respondent mother, who is watching this via the uh, live stream mechanism. Yes. Um, my lords, for the purposes of this appeal, I intend to refer to the parties simply and without, I hope, no discourtesy at all, as the mother and the father, yes. and the child M as either M or the child. Um, I think I've agreed, subject to any views that the court have, that we are to refer to the particular state that we're dealing with um, by the name of the state, and yes. I'm taking it that the court has no problem with that. And um, I hope that the court has the materials before it in an ordered and orderly fashion um, to permit it properly to engage with the arguments that we seek um, to deploy. Yes. Thank you. Um, this is, as the court is fully aware, uh, an appeal brought by the father against the order of Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot sitting in the family division, her order being the 22nd of December. Essentially, that order brought any hope of proceedings in this jurisdiction to an end for want of jurisdiction, uh, leaving the father with no recourse following the mother's retention of the child in Zambia. On behalf of the father, as the court is aware, we have sought to challenge that order on three grounds, uh, those grounds having been given permission to appeal by um, my Lord, Lord Justice Moylan. Although they're developed as ground one, two, and three, perhaps may be appropriate to deal with them in a different way, and unless the court directs me otherwise, I would intend to deal with them ground three being first, then ground one, and then ground two. So ground three, the case of the father, simply put, is that the convention, the 1996 convention, which is the fundamental jurisdictional foundation for cases involving children, in England and Wales applies as between not only contracting states to that convention, um, but states that are not contracting states. As to ground one, uh, we submit that the date of determination for the fundamental connecting factor within the convention, like so many conventions that have derived through the Hague Conference and indeed European regulations, uh, habitual residence is to be assessed as at the uh, time that the application is issued rather than as at the time that it's being determined. So that's to say many months after issuing at a trial. So to take uh, this case as an example, the application of the father was issued in, I think, uh, June, and the trial of the matter came on um, in November, late November, with a judgment in December. And there's ob there are obvious negative consequences um, if the court were to accept the position that it is at that date that the uh, determination of habitual residence would take place, but we'll come on to those consequences in due course if, if, if I'm permitted to. And then the third ground, which is ground two, considers the actual assessment undertaken by Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot. And in relation to that, what we say very simply is that it was superficial with the greatest courtesy to the judge, and it didn't properly engage um, with fundamental factors that uh, were relevant and would have uh, led the judge 
to a different conclusion. And so in that sense, um, it was a, a flawed assessment. And I don't in any way uh, overlook in relation to ground two, which I'll look at last, the fact that this was a judge that is experienced, uh, that this was a judge that heard oral evidence and considered um, written evidence, and I don't seek to overlook the learning uh, from this court in particular that doesn't likely interfere in determinations of that nature. But I say that when one drills down into that analysis, it's quite clear that it was um, uh, lacking in the detail and the depth that um, one uh, would wish it to be for the purposes of a, a, an appropriate assessment of habitual residence. So that, in, in, in essence, is a distillation of um, the father's uh, case. In terms of the substance, it's perhaps important, and not just important, as sometimes advocates will say, so that their clients can hear it, but important to emphasize to this court a certain number of factual matters that um, derive from the particular circumstances of this case that bring into stark light some of the unduly complicated patchwork of interrelationships between the different conventions and uh, domestic law. And I start from this premise, if I may. This was a not a father who delayed unduly in bringing a remedy to that which had happened. The factual findings identify, and we'll turn to particular factual matters shortly, but the factual matters identify factual determinations identify that the trip to Zambia in March 2022 was always expected to be a trip of short duration, principally so that the mother could go to a a memorial service for her own father who had died some five years prior to that date. It is undoubtedly um, true that prior to that, at least from December 2021, perhaps January 2022, the parents had been sharing the care of the young child Let's not forget that the child now is um, two years and one month old, so it was very young at the point that um, these matters were taking place. They were sharing the care of this child because the mother, very unfortunately, had had an extremely adverse reaction, I think, to a COVID vaccine, and so was suffering a range of health difficulties in the period from, I think, about um, December. And it is um, w without um, any question of doubt that the father from the period from March onwards was in a civilized and child-centered way attempting to establish what the mother's intentions were and whether um, he could see the child. And indeed that runs up until a message at the end of May where he says, again, with the utmost courtesy, that he's taken legal advice and he has um, received that legal advice and he's contemplating um, uh, taking legal proceedings. Um, all of that is important because there is, as this court knows, knows better than most courts, of such an emphasis now, particularly in the family division, on individuals accessing a non-court means intervention, so alternative dispute resolution, seeking um, 
to um, amicably settle things outside the court process. And that is, of course, entirely understandable. But that does not fit with the way in which um, the interpretation of some of these conventions would ap ap appear to follow. If it is that the court um, is emphasizing and encouraging such out-of-court uh, settlements, that is not something that is going to be consistent with the way in which um, my learned friend's team, and I have to accept a number of other judges in the division, have interpreted the critical convention that we're going to um, look at. And in fact, um, domestic statute, the 1986 um, Family Law Act, much criticized, um, but um, still very much in existence. But in a sense, I'm getting ahead of myself. I said I wanted to just highlight some factual matters. And I, I do so really reminding myself and, and, and keeping myself on the right route, not in any way suggesting that your lordships don't have um, these matters um, well in mind. That the parents, and one could take this in quite short order, the parents, it is accepted, commenced a relationship in this country in 2016, they, back, they cohabited <coughs> in this country uh, in 2017, and the mother had uh, spent some time in Zambia, as she says, um, up to once a year, or at least once a year, let me get it right, at least once a year um, in the years thereafter. The child was born in London on the 4th of March, 2021. Sorry, can I just stop? The, the mother um, was born, is this right, in Zambia, but had lived in England from a young age. Entirely correct. The mother uh, was born in uh, Zambia. Um, she travelled on her case, which I think is accepted, at least once a year, but she had been living in this country for since 2002. The child that then was born in um, London in, on the 4th of March uh, 2021. In April, the, the family home uh, was transferred into the joint names of both the mother and the father. In October 2021, the mother and the child spent some time in Zambia, about three weeks, and then returned to the family home in November. In November, the child was christened in this country, and the parties together spent Christmas in this country. In December, the mother became ill following a COVID vaccination. And therefore, the father's role in the child's life greatly increased in the period from December until March. It's important, we say, to note that the mother's own mother also was living in this country, and the father's own parents are also living in this country, and they were seeing the child. The mother and the father and the child and the mother's own mother then travel to Zambia on or around the 8th of March. They do so, as I've identified, to attend a memorial service for the mother's father. They travel on return tickets. And left behind is all of the items that one would expect 
be left behind when one is travelling on a short-term basis. But in particular, the mother's pet dog, the mother's Bentley car, almost all of the mother's clothes, almost all of the items relating to the child, all of which were in the jointly owned family home. The father um, returned to this country because of work commitments on or around the 20th of March. The mother remained in Zambia. And there is then a, a period where the parties are exchanging messages as to intentions, which result in the father on the 23rd of May messaging the mother, indicating that he does not agree to the child being kept in Zambia. He then travels um, to see the child in June for about uh, a week on the 2nd of June and the proceedings are dated the 23rd of June but in fact they're issued on the 6th of July and I interpolate there that the, even the process of issuing now, particularly post-COVID, has um, in some instances a delay to it. The matter then comes on um, for a first hearing before Mr Justice Peel on the 13th of July. And the court doesn't have his order, I don't think. We do, and we can provide it to the court. But it's interesting um, to note that that order contains a recording to it that says this. We'll provide the court with the um, order in due course. In the light of the delay caused by court availability for the final hearing, um, the parties record that they do not consider the passage of time between the filing of the application and the final determination of the issues a factor that should be allowed to influence the decision the court is making. Given the way in which the arguments uh, were determined, that is a somewhat ironic uh, recording because it was, in fact, um, at least in part, the very delay that took place between the issuing of the application and the determination of it that permitted the learned judge applying the law as she determined it to be to decide that habitual residence as at the point of late November the habitual residence of the child was in Zambia. Well, the judge said it was either day. Well, that's why I've emphasised in part. She says, of course, my lord, uh, and I acknowledge readily, um, that it was either November or indeed June. But when one looks at um, the analysis, it's a, a somewhat unstructured analysis. And furthermore, it includes matters that post-date June to support the uh, establishment of habitual residence uh, in Zambia. But we'll turn to that. But I take your Lordship's point and, and certainly do not overlook it. That's what happened on the 13th of July. Mr Justice Peel's order also made provision for some uh, video contact between uh, the father and the child on four occasions each week and some direct unsupervised daytime contact um, 
for a couple of hours if the father were to be able to travel to Zambia. And he does so uh, in September and has and spends time with the child on or around the 12th of September and on the 14th of September. On the, four, on the same day, on the 14th of September, the mother raises an allegation that the child has been subject to some, uh, has suffered a, a sexual injury to her genital area, and the child is examined and swabs are taken. The father then is charged on the 27th of September with an offence of defilement of the child. And at the end of September, on the 1st of October, the father leaves Zambia. And there is a dispute as between the parties as to whether those criminal proceedings are ongoing or whether they have been withdrawn. The father maintains that they are not ongoing, and the mother, I think, maintains that they are. At all events, the mother made an application in the Zambian courts for an order prohibiting any form of contact with the father. And so the present position is that an order has been made to that effect which prevents, prohibits the father from having any form of contact with the child. So in short, the father last had video contact with the child on the 9th of December and last saw the child face to face in Zambia in September. Just completing uh, the chronology, the matter uh, comes before Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot for a hearing on the 25th of um, October. The original um, order of Mr. Justice Peel, which provided for time to be spent with the child and the father in Zambia is suspended, and the relevance of that will appear um, later. The hearing then takes place before Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot on the 29th and the 30th of November, at which both parties give oral evidence. A draft judgment is circulated on the 19th of December. The judgment itself is formally handed down on the 23rd of December, uh, although the order was settled on the 22nd of um, December. I want now, if I may, to um, deal with um, what the father was seeking, because it may impact upon the particular statutory basis that he's able to engage. Um, the court has, um, and I want to apologise if, if, if at any point I descend into unnecessary detail or it becomes too technical. Um, I, not, not so far. Well, um, th th there isn't a way of avoiding some level of technicality. Um, uh, and at times it's difficult to um, tell the wood from the trees, but I, I will try my best. So what was the father seeking? And the reason why this is important, as I say, is it may um, impact upon the particular provisions that the father is able to rely upon. And it, in general terms, it must be remembered that parties are making applications under a huge amount of pressure, generally in urgent circumstances. And they may be doing it without easy access to the most specialist 
types of lawyers who have expertise in international family proceedings. And I say that to um, highlight the real difficulty that the that individuals such as this father may well be in, given the com complicated nature of the interlinked um, statutory provisions. But what was it that the father was seeking? We have within the bundle um, his original application, uh, which is at page 278 of the core bundle. This is the form C66, obviously for different types of proceedings there are different types of form, and this form uh, is headed up application for inherent jurisdiction order in relation to children, and what the father seeks at 278 is an order for the return of uh, the child from another state. and. There is within that form a short description at page 283. Under the heading, What Do You Want the Court to Do? The applicant father respectfully, respectfully requests that the court exercises its inherent jurisdiction to order the return of his daughter to England following her wrongful retention in Zambia by the respondent mother. And then there's brief details about what the application is about. And there is a statement in support, uh, which is unfortunately doesn't follow that application, but is to be found at page 71 of. And I'm referring to the pages of the bundle rather than the electronic pages, but I can swap to electronic pages if it's better for support. But at page. 71 of the core appeal bundle, there is the statement in support, and it's a relatively short statement. Headed up applicant father's statement in support of application for the return of a child pursuant to the court's inherent jurisdiction. And I draw attention to paragraph 10 of that, where the father says, I think. Therefore, respectfully, and this is at page 71, I therefore respectfully request that the court makes an order pursuant to the court's inherent jurisdiction that, that the child is returned home, her country of birth, and where she has resided since birth. I believe that the ongoing wrongful retention of the child outside of the jurisdiction will be having a significant detrimental impact upon her, as our relationship will be da damaged very quickly if we are not reunited and she's forced to be separated from me on a permanent basis. It's imperative that the child has a relationship with both her parents, and I urgently wish her, for her to be returned home. Well, what he feared has come to pass. Um, but the, the question of what the father was seeking is important when one comes to look at the basis on which the court may have jurisdiction. And this, the court may think, provides for an unfortunate and extremely complicated uh, set of consequences that the ordinary individual, or if I can be permitted to say, the ordinary lawyer grappling with such a situation won't necessarily understand or be one might think, be expected to understand, because it appears to be thus, and I'll show this by reference in a minute to the, the particular statute and the convention, but it appears to be the situation that if one is applying for what has been previously termed a bare return order, so an order under the inherent jurisdiction simply seeking the return of a child from a, another country, usually a non-contracting state to one of the conventions. 
then the basis for jurisdiction is and can only be the 19, in family cases, in the 1996 Hague Convention. However, if an application is made for a bare return order, but is also accompanied by an application, for example, for a lives with order, or an order that the child should see the particular person seeking their return, then it allows that person not only to rely on the jurisdiction of the 1996 Hague Convention, but in the event that jurisdiction is not provided for by that convention, to rely on the terms of the domestic law, that's to say section 11D, of the Family Law Act in Section 2 and Section 3. So um, that is a matter of some importance in terms of what you put on the application. But what you're seeking is essentially the same, that you may be penalised, an individual, a litigant may be penalised if, for whatever reason, and it often won't be their own fault, they do not seek to um, accompany their bare return order application with an application that domestically they want to spend time with the child or have the child to live um, with with them. That's the general explanation, but in the somewhat um, unlocated terms that I put it, it may be a little bit difficult to follow, but I want to um, show you, if I may, the basis on which that result takes place. But you may say, well, why, in fact, does that matter? Why should it matter that um, an individual, can, in one instance, can only, apply, can only rely on the 1996 Convention for jurisdiction, but in another instance can rely on the 96 Convention and the family um, Law Act. It matters because the date of the assessment of habitual residence is potentially different. So under the Convention, on my learned friend's arguments and arguments that have been accepted in other jurisdictions and in other instances, the date of assessment is the date of the determination. In this case, the end of November. But under the Family Law Act, the date of assessment of habitual residence is the date of the issuing of the application. So those who have um, the ability to rely on the Family Law Act get an advantage because the affliction of time may not run against them. This is um, perhaps best uh, illustrated by looking actually at, finally, the Convention and the Family Law Act. And we have that within the... Um, bundle of authorities and other materials. Um, the, the Family Law Act is at page, begins at page one of the bundle of authorities. And by reason of quick explanation, th th this act was promulgated to originally uh, dis determine jurisdictional uh, disputes in constituent parts of the UK. That's how it was originally um, uh, intended. By the um, 1990s, um, this court uh, seized upon it as a means to locate jurisdiction in family cases. And then with the advent of the harmonization of European law in the um, late, uh, late 1990s, early 2000s, the particular 
regulations that determine jurisdiction in family cases were grafted on to the Family Law Act. So the, the prior to Brexit, the regulation that determined uh, jurisdiction in family cases was a regulation called Brussels II Revised that came into force on the 1st of March 2005, and it was grafted on to um, the Family Law Act. Following Brexit, we rely on the 1996 Hague Convention. So looking just then at this Act, um, Section 1 deals with the orders to which Part 1 applies. And for the purposes of this case, we need to consider Section 1.1. Subject to the following provisions of the section, in this part, Part 1 order means A, a Section 8 order made by a court in England and Wales under the Children Act, other than an order bearing or discharging such an order. And then one travels to the next relevant provision, which is Section 1.1d, which is a Part 1 order means 1.1d, an order made by a court in England and Wales in the exercise of the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court with respect to children, one, so far as it gives care of a child to any person or provides for contact with or the education of a child. So the question arises, having looked at the C66, having looked at paragraph 10 of the uh, statement in support of the C66, but not critically forgetting the orders that were made in the course of the proceedings providing for contact between the father and the child in Zambia, both direct and indirect, can or does what the, the father seek, does it fall within either section 11A or section 11 one D. My learned friend says um, it doesn't, and my position is that I can understand why he says that, but it may be arguable that it does. Well, it, it, it is. I mean, in A and A, uh, Baroness Hell uh, expressly identified that a return order could be made, could be a Section Eight order, or could, or could be an order made under inherent jurisdiction. So it depends. You can. It depends. Yes. Yes. And the, the uh, yes. So, so the fact that it's a return order doesn't mean it's not a section one one a. It doesn't necessarily follow. No. Then one moves to section um, two of the Family Law Act. A court in England and Wales shall not shall not make a section one one a order with respect to a child unless it has jurisdiction under the Hague Convention, the nineteen ninety six Hague Convention. Or, B, the Hague Convention does not apply, but, and then we go to Roman numeral 2, the condition in section 3 of the Act is satisfied. And the condition in um, uh, section 3 of the Act, if one goes on, is that at the relevant date, the child is habitually resident in England and Wales. And the relevant date is the date on which the application is issued. Then, so much then for the Family Law Act. If one then um, moves to... Can I just go back to 2.1b? Yes, can I just go back myself? 2.1b. So first, or maybe 2.1a. But you can't make a Section 11A order unless you have jurisdiction under the provisions of the Hague Convention. Yes. Uh, 2.1b says the Hague Convention does not apply. Yeah. And I take that to mean does not apply in the sense of establishing jurisdiction. Yes. Because as you said, the, uh, the Hague Convention potentially applies to any parental responsibility order. It doesn't distinguish between inherent jurisdiction or because it not concerned with that. Yes. So do we sort of read in to 2.1b 
the Hague Convention does not apply or, or the court does not have jurisdiction under the Hague Convention. It must be the same. I think that would different be different wording, but it must have the same I think that meaning. would be my reading of it. There is a decision by Mr. Justice Baker, as he then was, uh, in the similar, relating to the similar wording when it said the regulation. And um, he deals with this, and I can't, I'm afraid. Wait, I, I said something along those lines in a recent case in respect of matrimonial proceedings. Um, this was the case that um, has recently come out. Was it, was it, is it the case in connection with that case? Yes, that's it. Um, right, OK, sorry. Thank you. Um, then one uh, moves um, to the convention, which is at uh, page um, 10. And uh, this follows the usual structure of uh, the Hague Conference conventions, recitals as to intentions, uh, Article 1 providing for the objects, um, Article 3 providing the scope of the convention, so the measures that are referred to of protection may deal in particular with, so it's not a, an exhaustive list, but the attribution, exercise, termination, or restriction of parental responsibility, <coughs> um, perhaps of the most important, but also rights of custody. And then the, the provisions that we are dealing with. Um, which have not been dealt with by this court previously. So chapter two, setting out uh, jurisdiction. Again, the chapters uh, of the convention needing to be read as a whole, jurisdiction coming before applicable law, which was something of a novelty in the family law sphere, and then recognition and enforcement, which wasn't. But just looking at jurisdiction, um, Article 5.1, the judicial administrative authorities of the contracting state of the habitual residence of the child have jurisdiction to take measures directed to the protection of the child's personal property. Um, some might say that, that the terminology measures directed to the protection of the child is a little bit unusual, but it essentially covers matters of parental responsibility. Then Article 5.2, subject to Article 7, which we'll come to, in a case of a change of the child's habitual residence to another contracting state, and obviously um, for us the terminology um, is important, the authorities of the state of the new habitual residence have jurisdiction. Art Article 6 doesn't apply, but Article 7 for the purpose of this case is um, of significance and importance. In case of wrongful removal or retention of the child, the authorities of the contracting state in which the child was habitually resident immediately before the removal or retention keep their jurisdiction until the child has acquired a habitual residence in another state. And the dispute between us, simply put, is does that only apply as between contracting states? So when they say another state, do they mean, do the draftsmen mean another contracting state or do they mean another state? And, and then it goes on uh, to say that the jurisdiction is kept until certain defined matters have taken place, which are set out at um, A and B. And then the learned friends and the judge pay particular attention to and uh, emphasize Article 7. Three, which says, so long as the authorities first mentioned in paragraph one keep their jurisdiction, the authorities of the contracting state to which the child has been removed or in which he or she has been retained can take only such urgent measures under Article 11 as are necessary for the protection of the personal property of the child. Well, Article 11, one can go to, and it permits uh, contracting states 
in cases, all cases of urgency, um, to take any necessary measures um, in the event that there is a child or property belonging to the child being present in that state. And obviously the intention is pretty clear from Article 7, which is to ensure that no one has a jurisdictional advantage when they remove or retain a child unlawfully. And this convention is to supplement and complement the 1980 Hague Convention, which is the jurisdictional framework which is most used to repatriate wrongful, wrongfully removed or retained um, children. And so that's the essential issue between us, is does Article 7 have a greater reach um, or does it have a, a narrow um, uh, reach? Um, but it's clear that the, the relief that the father seeks would fall within the terms of the convention. And it's clear that if Article 5 doesn't apply, then an individual subject to this court's decision would be able to rely in certain circumstances on Article 7. So that is just a, a, a quick look, and I'm going to return to the convention um, uh, later, but it's a quick look at it. Um, but before I do so, I, I do want to just um, emphasize some factual findings made by Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot. Is it worth looking at Article 13? Well, we're it is. It is. So here the, the scheme continues and uh, again makes reference to the authorities of a contracting state which have the jurisdiction under Articles 5 to 10 which obviously includes Article 7 um, and it requires them to abstain from exercising a jurisdiction if at the time of the commencement of the proceedings corresponding measures have been requested from the authorities of another contracting state. And we'll probably look at the Lagarde report, which is the explanatory report on um, these provisions. Unfortunately, and, and uh, this is perhaps just my own fault, but it's a points rather opaque, and it's difficult to um, to unravel exactly what uh, the professor um, is is indicating. But we'll try and cut through it as best we can. But it's important to note, just continuing a, a general theme that within the convention there is um, reference to non-contracting states and to simply states and then reference to contracting states and there are instances where it is plain as a pike staff that, and so said in the explanatory report that the draftsmen were intending that the, there should be a dynamism between contracting states and non-contracting states. So to give one example, I mean it's, it's a small example, but there are lots of them, um, but within the applicable law provisions of Chapter 3, um, Article 20 indicates that the provisions of that chapter apply even if the law designated by them is the law of a non-contracting state. Um, can I just though, before returning to the meat of the, the 
the legal argument, emphasize with reference to certain parts of the judgment. And that requires us to go to the core uh, appeal bundle and just um, pick out some aspects of the judgment. The judgment's at uh, page 37. And the findings are set out in particular paragraphs from paragraph 43 um, onwards. And I just want uh, to pick, pick out a couple of points. Uh, paragraph 50, the judge found that despite the mother's evidence, uh, which included written and oral evidence, the father did not consent to a permanent move of the child to Zambia. Um, she went on, the judge, however, to um, find in the same paragraph that st the stability and integration of the child in life in Zambia outweighed a lack of consent. And her, her conclusion as to habitual residence is set out at paragraph 51 which is that the father's, at the point, and this is the point uh, that the Lord made, the point of the father's application to this court in June and well before the hearing in November, she states, I find it clear that this young child ach achieved some degree of integration in the social and family environment in Zambia. She goes on, um, uh, paragraph 52 to deal with some further findings but she puts them under the heading of consent and one of the criticisms that I'm going to make going down the line is that she silos her analysis but I'm, I'm not going to um, develop those unless I'm required to at this point just one point the paragraph 51 and the judge comes back to it later on the issue of habitual residence but um, when she says, I find it clear this young child to achieve some degree of integration, on one reading, it looks as though the judge is saying that's the test for habitual residence. Well, that is, I think, what she's saying. Right. What other reading could there be? <laughs> I, and I don't mean that in any way discourteously, but it's, it's uh, at the end of her analysis on habitual residence, and it's a quotation. And it sort of wraps it up. But that isn't the test for habitual residence. That's a feature of it. It's not the test. Well, uh, my, my lord's anticipating one Sorry, of okay. my criticisms. Yes. Um, rather typically, your head. Um, but exactly, <coughs> exactly so. But your submission is, and you're coming back to it, that that that, that you you say the only uh, sensible reading of it is the judge considers that the words in. Uh, parentheses are all the words in italics uh, in inverted commas are the um, the test to be applied for the purposes of determining the true uh, that seems to be uh, almost well, I don't I don't want to overstate it because that's not a, an appropriate piece of advocacy but it seems to be um, exactly what she she thinks because it comes at the end of her analysis on habitual residence and if you like it wraps it up and that is one of the errors that we, 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 we indicate that she fell into. Uh, 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 another error, which I just trail but don't develop, is the siloing of her analysis. Because what she does, in, in my submission, um, is to wrap up her analysis on habitual residence in paragraph 51 with that uh, conclusive uh, apparent quotation as her direction. But then she moves on to a separate set of findings, 
reasons, which she describes as under the heading consent. But that is directly related, my lords, to her analysis of Article 7 of the Convention, because if the father had consented, then he wouldn't be able to rely on Article 7, because it wouldn't be a wrongful removal or retention. And so our argument goes, and will be developed in this way, that the analysis that takes place after paragraph 52 is a perfectly legitimate analysis, but it contains all sorts of material and findings that properly should have been included in the equation, the habitual residence assessment and equation, and the balancing exercise that's required uh, within such an assessment. But they're not. They're, if you like, vacuum packed in the paragraphs um, outside paragraphs 43 to 51. And it, anticipating a response from the court, it's not good enough to say, as sometimes one's able to say, look, well, we've got to read the judgment um, as a whole. Uh, this is an experienced judge. This is the sort of assessment that she um, may be used to doing. My response to that is, well, actually, looking at the structure and the analysis, that doesn't hold weight, because she's made her conclusion at paragraph 51. She's then, if you like, turned off the habitual residence road, and she's running down the Article 7, she's driving down the Article 7 consent road, and the material that is relevant, that should have travelled down the first road, never goes down that road, because she's concluded her analysis. Um, uh, just finishing then the, the, the points as to factual um, findings uh, we have at paragraph 52 a finding that, that the fact that the mother had left the sessions behind amongst other evidence, leads the judge to the conclusion that the mother had planned a short trip of a fortnight or so, so a really short trip, one might think, to go to the paternal grandfather's memorial service and for the mother to take her business plans forward. Well, the mother had set up a company in Zambia and had undertaken a certain amount of preliminary um, work in uh, establishing that business, but no not much further than that. Then one moves to paragraph 56 as a, for, a, for a further finding. The judge concludes that at some point before the 23rd of May, and probably soon after the father had left Zambia on the 20th of March, the mother had decided not to return to England, but to make her life either in Zambia or in South Africa. Now, that's important, we say, for two simple reasons. First, that her intention is unclear. Was she going to uh, remain in Zambia? Was she going to move to South Africa? Or was she indeed, as was later contemplated, going to return to the UK, subject to the father <coughs> paying her a considerable sum? The second uh, point of relevance in relation to that observation, that finding at 56, paragraph 56, is that she makes, she changes her mind pretty shortly after the father leaves, and she doesn't communicate that to him. And then at paragraph 75, a further finding. which is that the father did not acquiesce um, to the child's retention in Zambia. He did not clearly and unequivocally show that he was not going to assert his right to the return of the child. And paragraph 76, I find that the father was trying to compromise matters 
with the mother because she was vulnerable and been ill. She was Zambian and he was hoping that if he agreed to her remaining there on a temporary basis that his contact with the child would take place and that she would eventually return to England in the way she had before. But this was a, a gentleman, a father, who was doing everything he could, having regard to the mother's vulnerability and having regard to not wanting um, to do anything that would um, separate him from uh, his daughter and was making all sorts of compromises and, in, and engaging with the mother about what should happen. Morally, if I, I don't seek to major on that in any respect, but he was doing everything that a caring and intelligent father would do. And yet, and again, I don't want to overstate this, that he's penalised for adopting that approach. He's penalised because the law apparently um, doesn't give him a remedy once that period of seeking an amicable and child-focused settlement comes to an end. And if the law remains as it is, then potentially it provides a greater encouragement for litigants not to cooperate prior to taking proceedings, but to, to issue with as much speed and force as is possible. Um, I want then now to turn to the uh, the grounds of appeal and to develop um, the arguments uh, in a way that um, perhaps will amplify the terms that we have uh, set out our arguments in our skeleton argument. Um, Perhaps a useful, albeit um, interpretively uh, potentially suspect way of looking at matters is to look at the uh, practical handbook which has been uh, provided by the Hague Conference on the 1996 um, Hague Convention. It's an extremely useful guide. But it is a guide, and it has, of course, um, no binding interpretive force. It's within the authorities um, bundle, page uh, 508. It's actually a very lengthy document, and um, I think we've extracted the relevant parts to it. This is the, the practical handbook that's published by the Hague Conference. It was published in 2014, so of some age. But the relevant, but for the purposes of the courts and assistance, the relevant passages may be these. Um, one starts probably best at, uh, uh, at page 39, and there's some flowcharts that um, seek to assist uh, the way in which one travels through the particular parts of the um, convention. Um, the, the overall page number in the bundle would be more useful. Uh, the overall page number is uh, is page 526, the bottom right, my lord? Yes. Is that, is that helpful? The flow chart. That's the flow chart. <coughs> um, so it provides a, a mechanism. Does the competent authority have jurisdiction to certain general rule? That's the general article 5. If it doesn't, then does it have jurisdiction pursuant to the articles 6, 7, or 10? Um, if it doesn't, then you can only rely on that Article 11, the urgent measures one. Um, if it does have jurisdiction pursuant to Article 7, then yes, you, you can take protective measures. 
And then the next passage that might be relevant, page 527, paragraph 4.8 and 4.9. I'm sorry if your lordships have looked at this before. I, I don't mean to, to make inefficient use of the court's time. Um, uh, it says that the Convention does not provide for the concept of continuing jurisdiction. It should remember that a change of the fixed residence of the child does not terminate any measures already taken. So it may be that the court uh, believes that 4.9 supports Malone Friend's arguments. Um, then 4.11, page 528. Well, I think again 4.10. Yes. Uh, 4.10, uh, referring to the principle of RTO 4i not applying. Well, it's the use of the word suggests. The explanatory report suggests that the principle does yes. not apply. Yes. Yes. And again, the explanatory report, um, I mean, it's I, th I think it would uh, be, and I've got to remind myself what Mrs. Justice Lieben says in, in her in the case where she decided it, but I, I, generally speaking, explanatory reports are part of the travail, and uh, so are aids to interpretation, but I need to, I need to remind yes. myself. But what 4.10 says is the explanatory report suggests the principle doesn't apply. And then where it does occur, in other words, where the child's official residence occurs, consideration might be given to use of the transfer of jurisdiction provision. Yes. Which, which obviously don't apply in cases which involve a non control Well, don't apply in ca cases, but also suggests that jurisdiction is not automatically lost. Yeah, it, because otherwise you wouldn't need to uh, give consideration to the use of the transfer of jurisdiction provisions. And so if that is what applies, it places in the court the decision of whether or not jurisdiction should actually transfer yes. because the other court is better placed to yes. make the decision. Yes. So that, I mean, it's just one sentence in, a, as you say, a very, very long time, but it, it's, it's 4.10 doesn't... Um, it doesn't, it's not, it's not middle stump to... It, my it, doesn't, friend. It, it doesn't make it clear that you lose jurisdiction no, if doesn't. you're already seized of proceedings. Um, and, and in fact, there is a passage in the Lagarde report that insofar as um, Professor George and I had tried to unravel it, might be supportive of that approach too, but I want to emphasise that it might be. It's very difficult to unravel, but we'll, we'll, we'll try and unravel it later. But just moving through without in any way overlooking or not seeking to overlook things. Uh, again, 4.11, uh, it records that if a child's habitual residence changes from a contracting state to a non-contracting state during the proceedings, the principle of Perpetuatio 4i also does not apply. But it goes on to say, however, Article 5 of the Convention will cease to be applicable from the time of the date the time of the change of the child's habitual residence. Nothing therefore stands in the way of retention of jurisdiction by the authorities of the contracting state under their non-convention rules, which might be thought to be the Family Law Act in our case. However, it's important to remember that in this scenario, other contracting states will not be bound by the convention to recognize the measures. Then we get on to the exceptions to the general rule. And um, relevant here is four point twenty, which deals with jurisdiction in cases of international child abduction and Article Seven in particular. Um, there, it gives the intention behind Article Seven. It's a deterrent to which seeks to deny any, uh, forgive me, at page 529, it's a deterrent to deny any jurisdictional benefit to the abducting party. 4.21 indicates the definition of wrongful removal or retention is 
the same as found in the other convention. And then 4.22 breaks up the conditions by which jurisdiction can change and vest in the authorities of the state to which the child was wrongfully removed. And again, even within this report, it doesn't use the word contracting state within this handbook. Um, then at 4.24 of page 532, there's again another flowchart that seeks to illustrate the operation of Article 7. Um, again, it doesn't talk about... Um, Contracting states, it just simply says the state of the child's new habitual residence. Um, there then are some examples that the, the handbook provides to illustrate the way in which the rules work. And one of the points that is taken against us is well, both the examples provided are examples that deal with situations where both countries are contracting states. And nowhere is an example given of a situation where it's um, dealing with a contracting state and a non contracting state. What um, it says in four um, eleven is where the child's habitual residence changes from a contracting state to a non-contracting state, then you fall outside the um, scope of Article Five. Yes. Um, in respect of um, Article Seven. It says that the authority of the contracting state of the habitual residence of the child immediately before the wrongful retention or removal retain jurisdiction. But you still have to invoke that jurisdiction. So it's a theoretical jurisdiction until it's invoked. So is it the date on which you commence proceedings? even in, in a case to which Article 7 applies? Well, it, it, it probably must be, must it? Not. Well, it's, isn't it the date... I've got to think this through, and I'm thinking on my feet, which is always dangerous um, to do in front of um, the Court of Appeal. Um, Let's come back to it when we've looked through the... I mean, the, the, the wording is in similar terms as to Article 10, and so what you're looking at is the position prior to the wrongful removal or retention. Yes. So in this case, the wrongful removal, it's a wrongful retention because the court has determined that shortly after the father left on the 20th of March, the mother decided not to return. So that's the point at which you crystallise a retention. Is it? Well, Does I think the judge actually identify when the wrongful retention took place? No, but, it, it, no. but, but what we're told uh, by the Supreme Court in relation to retentions is that it's an intention manifested, manifested by certain acts. Yes. So... She's identified the intention. What are the acts? Well, the acts are her seeking Same. to employ people, right. buying okay. um, stuff for the nursery, um, not... Uh, anyway, the judge doesn't identify the date when the wrongful retention took place. She doesn't, but let's okay. let just moving forward with that, just this hypothesis. If, that, if I'm right, then the retention is at some point shortly after the father goes on the 20th of March, 
and that the court will then look at habitual residence prior to that point. And so we would First say was asking. we would say that obviously that the particular child in this case is obviously still habitually resident in England and Wales because she's only travelled for a short period of time and phys phys been physically present in Zambia for some seven days or so. I think that's the way that I would answer the question. I want to, um, within the discussion on uh, ground three, to look at some examples where there is an obvious interaction between contracting states and non-contracting states. And um, we, we, if I may, could we return to the, the convention itself? We've looked at some already, um, but just returning to it, the obvious places perhaps are Article 11 of the Convention, 11.3. Article 11 obviously deals with cases of urgency. Article 11.3 says the measures taken under paragraph 1 with regard to a child who is habitual residence in a non contracting state shall lapse in each contracting state as soon as measures required by the situation and taken by the authorities of another state are recognized in the contracting state in question. There's an example within the confines of the convention of there being specific reference and an effect relating to a non contracting state. We looked at Article 15.2 and Article 20 already. Article 16 also deals um, under the applicable law chapter. This is page 14 of the authorities bundle. When it says the attribution or extinction of parental responsibility by operation of law without the intervention of a judicial or ministry authority is governed by the law of the state of the habitual residence of the child, the law of the state of the habitual residence of the child includes both contracting states and non-contracting states. And then finally, a reference that I made earlier, Article 36, page 17 of the um, Convention, provides in any case where the child is exposed to a serious danger, the competent authorities of the contracting state where measures for the protection of the child have been taken or under consideration, if they are informed that the child's residence has changed to or that the child is present in another member state, shall inform the authorities of that other state about the danger involved and the measures taken or under consideration. If one looks at the Lagarde report, we don't need to go through it, but it's at paragraph 150, page 595 of the authorities bundle, it's clear that that uh, was a provision that was intended to apply as between a contracting state and a non-contracting state. So simply put, without overstating it, there is a plain dynamism between certain provisions within the convention and non-contracting states. question then um, that the court and we're seeking to grapple with um, does article 7 apply as between a contracting uh, state and a non-contracting state what, what do we rely on well we rely as the court will know on, on the, the actual words contained within the convention and within article 7 Um, and the specific use use of the words contracting states to delineate a particular state with mere states or non-contracting states to delineate a state that isn't contracting um, to the convention. And we say that the use of those words, which comes following a, a, on of a very 
extensive and detailed drafting uh, program is not accidental or random. It's something that is deliberate. And that is why, in our analysis, Article 7 has the reach that it does. And in that regard, it's of interest to note that Mr. Justice Williams appears to take a, a similar view in, um, in the case of FA and MA, which is in the authorities bundle um, at page 192. Can I just ask you a question which may be a very basic one? If, looking at Article 7.1, you say this applies as between a contracting state and a non-contracting state. Well, it can apply as, yes, um, either or. So, what is the, first of all, is it non we're talking about the move from a contracting state to a non-contracting state. Yes. What is the non-contracting state on your hypothesis applied to do or refrain from doing as a result of the application of Article 7? It, uh, it doesn't necessarily need to do uh, anything or refrain from doing anything because the question is put in a different way. Does, in that instance, does the contracting state lose its jurisdiction? Well, um, we, in a sense, this is what I was leading on to. Nothing by definition in Article 7 can bind no. a non contracting no. state. So, uh, my response, uh, my Lord, to um, uh, that is that nothing in uh, the Convention nor within Article 7 can bind a non um, contracting state. But what the Convention can do is to ensure that there is a ready and uniform jurisdiction available in circumstances where a particular child needs protecting. Now that may result in, if you like, two available jurisdictions, but that is better than a jurisdiction, one available jurisdiction, that may not um, provide a remedy in circumstances where the child has been abducted. I mean, read literally, even, even if you read state in the third line as contracting state, you, you would say it just means that the first contracting state simply doesn't lose its jurisdiction yes. until there's habitual residence acquired in another contracting state, i.e. as between the contracting states. Yes. The fact that there may have been an intervening non-contracting state doesn't change that. This no. is just allocation of jurisdiction as between contracting states. Yes. So if you have a child in contracting state A um, removed to non-contracting state, state until it gets to and then gets contracting, to state, another contracting, contracting state, state B or C. The point is that the original contracting state doesn't lose its jurisdiction exactly as unless or until another contracting state becomes the exactly. state of habitual residence. And all that you say this is doing as between contracting states, allocating jurisdiction between, in our the hypothesis, we've just been talking about state A and state C, and the fact there's been an intervening state B, non-contracting, just doesn't matter. No. Not, not as far as this is concerned. Exactly so. So if one reads it with inserting a, wo a word, contracting in, that's the result of it. And that leads to the, the second point that we make is, well, what is the purpose of What's the objective of this particular, in interpreting it, what is the objective of this particular provision? Well, it's plainly to prohibit a jurisdictional march to permit children to, um, to for parents to be permitted to engage properly with a jurisdiction to have a remedy available to them and to protect children generally from the scourge of unlawful removals and retentions. And um, 
that would, we would suggest, support the interpretation that we put forward, whichever way one puts it. We were going to look at uh, what Mr. Justice Williams um, said in the case of FA and MA. If you, if all you need is the paragraph you've cited in the skeleton argument, paragraph 54, and you don't need the context, then just take us to that. But if you do need the context, then go to the case. Um, we've got quite a, a, a lengthy... Um, You're quite right, Lord. I can simply rely... I can simply rely on paragraph 54. I don't need to take your lordships to that. I'm so which I, I missed the reference. Um, the reference is paragraph 54 yep. of the skeleton argument. Um, and my lord, Lord Justice Dean, quite rightly points out that there's an unduly lengthy uh, extract from um, the case that I was going to take your lordships to, but I don't need to, FA and MA, which simply... Um, illustrates that Mr. Justice Williams, who has um, some considerable expertise in this area, um, opined that um, Article 7 could be, uh, on a literal reading of the words, applied as between a contracting state or a non-contracting state. And that's simply his observations. Um, now, my learned friend's response, which I, I, I might as well deal with now, is, well, one of the responses, I don't seek to diminish the quality or the quantity of them, but one of them is, well, um, you may be right as to the uh, use of um, the wording, but in the subsequent regulation, which had its inspiration from the 1996 convention. In the subsequent family regulation, which is called Brussels II Revised, there was an equivalent provision, which is called Article 10. And the provision essentially provided for the same residual or retention of jurisdiction as between a regulation state, and the question mark was to a was it to another member state or was it to a non-member state? And the, this court found in a case called Reage that it had the import of an interpretation that we submit in relation to Article Seven, but the Court of Justice in relation to the regulation said no, it's only as between member states. But that's one of the points that are taken against us um, in the interpretation that I'm presenting to the court. Uh, essentially, it's, the, it's the, the very point that we've been discussing was the way in which this court decided it. Lady Justice Black, as she then was, decided it. But then the Court of Justice of the European Union said that the regulation provision only applied as between uh, member states. But in support of our interpretation, therefore, we rely on the, 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 the words contained within the Convention. Um, we rely on the fact that the Convention expressly engages at different provisions with non-contracting states. We rely on the objectives and purpose of the Convention to protect the best interests of children in relation to wrongful removals and retentions, to deter child abductions, to ensure, as I've said, um, that individuals don't steal a jurisdictional march, don't get provided with a jurisdictional advantage, which in this case is this case is a is a is a pretty clear um, indication. Um, for example, uh, the father's uh, ability to engage with the Zambian courts may be prejudiced by any potential criminal sanction that he may or may not be facing. But we also um, rely on 
in support of our interpretation some uh, first instance decisions, but particularly um, the first instance decision of Mr Justice MacDonald in a case called London Borough of Hackney and P. And I think I will have to take your lordships to this one, albeit pretty briefly. Yeah. But what we say um, before we go to it is that this is a, a very careful analysis by uh, Mr Justice MacDonald, but in the context of consideration of Article 5, so the general rule, I can describe it like that, and um, his essential conclusion was that the 1996 Hague Convention is the first port of call in the same way that the regulation was prior to Brexit um, for cases concerning parental responsibility. And it was the first port of call, irrespective of whether, for example, that the child is present in a non-contracting state. We go on to say that his analysis can be imported by analogy um, into supporting our interpretation, because his analysis, albeit that it's directed to Article 5, it falls within Chapter 2, so the jurisdictional framework chapter, and therefore should apply, if it applies as to Article 5, it should apply mutatis mutandis in relation to Article 7. But the, it's a very lengthy judgment, and I simply just want to highlight some passages without um, uh, having to read them out or in, in any way to, um, to delay unduly. But it's, um, it's an important uh, analysis, and it starts um, at page 122. To 122, um, thank you very much of the um, authorities bundle. So in this um, instance, in this case, the applications were for a public or public law order, a care order, but also an application for an order for the summary return to Tunisia under the inherent jurisdiction of the High Court. For the purposes of the argument that I seek to mount with Professor George, we uh, direct the court to paragraph 2, page 126, which illustrates the applications that are before the court and the issues that the court with which the court was engaged. But does the paragraph 3, Roman 1, does the jurisdictional scheme under Chapter 2 of the Hague Convention apply to care proceedings? And if so, does it apply to those proceedings, notwithstanding this case involves a non-convention state? Um, then, for the purposes of um, our later discussion, Subparagraph three: If the question of habitual residence falls to be determined, what is the relevant date for that determination? And then the 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 passages that we seek to rely upon are at page one hundred and fifty-three to start with. And again, um, I simply want to. Uh, highlight them, but uh, to allow the court to consider them. I, I don't think it's going to be helpful if I go through it line by line. But we rely on paragraph 67 to um, 93. But in particular, I do want to just highlight Some points. Um, 
page 155, paragraph 72. where the judge says the jurisdictional provisions of Chapter 2 of the 1996 Hague Convention will be the first port of call when determining jurisdiction in proceedings. Obviously, these are Part 4 proceedings, so they're public law proceedings, but that doesn't matter, I say. Um, and that's shown by paragraph 75, page 156, where... The judge identifies a care order plainly concerns the attribution, exercise, and restriction of parental responsibility. Um, then, page 158, paragraph 84, a reference to the Supreme Court decision of AMA, but in the context of Brussels 2A. The judge goes on to say there's nothing in the terms of the provisions of Chapter 2 of Brussels 2A governing attribution of jurisdiction that prevented their operation in a case involving a non-member state. He goes on, paragraph 85, to say, within this context, a survey of the overall structure of the 1996 K Convention demonstrate, demonstrates that it too draws a clear distinction between the position in a contracting state and the position as between contracting states. Uh, then paragraph 87, uh, page 159, about seven lines up, he says, there's nothing on the face of Article 5 to suggest that the article ceases to address the position in a contracting state in cases in which there is or may be a rival jurisdiction in a non-contracting state. Article 5.1 does not expressly exclude the attribution of jurisdiction to a contracting state based on habitual residence simply because there is or may be a rival jurisdiction in a non-contracting state, nor does Article 5.1 imply that this is the position. Then, paragraph 89, page 160. Um, final... Within this context, in my judgment, there's nothing in either Article 11.3 or Article 12.3 that either expressly or by implication limits the operation of Article 5.1 to cases in which the rival jurisdiction is a contracting state. Mr. Deborah, I'm getting a little concerned about time. Yes, or quite rightly, my lord. Um, ground three. Uh, we haven't yet got to ground one or ground two. Uh, you really need to sit down by the I will do. I will do. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and I, 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 I'm taking that very much on board. Let me try and slip out of second gear. Um, then the further paragraphs that we rely on are uh, paragraph 92 at page 5. Page 161. Um, I also then want to refer the court to two further passages, just including submissions on ground three. Um, the first is the case, a passage in the case of H&R, um, which is page 217. So this is a case that involved um, children who um, were sought to be returned uh, to Libya. I think, in Libya or Libya. I think they, they, were, they were being returned from, from Libya. And 
the passages that we seek to rely on in particular are the discussion that the judge has at two at page two two four paragraphs twenty three which deals with um some of the points that uh, I made earlier about the nature of the application. And essentially the judge's conclusion at paragraph 45 where he says, where the other country, in this case Libya, is a non-contracting state, the position is that if habitual residence lies in England at the date of the trial, Article 5 is operative and England retains jurisdiction. If, however, between the issue, between issuing and hearing, habitual residence is transferred to Libya, then Article Five ceased to apply and national law became operative. So there, another example, uh, along with Hackney and P, where um, the, the judge is applying um, the convention as between a contracting state and a non-contracting state. And finally, in relation to um, ground three, I want to um, just. refer the court to a section of the Lagarde report, the explanatory report, um, which is at page 541. But in particular, I want to invite the court as, it, at it, as I want to invite the court at its leisure to consider paragraphs 46 to 51, which is at pages, and I don't need the court to look at it now, which is at pages 565 to 567 of the authorities bundle. And in particular, to consider the passage above the title of paragraph 2 on page 567 and, and um, I'm directing that in particular to Lord Justice Moyland uh, but also to the court as a whole. Um, it's a very lengthy passage that I've referred to but I think it's important for the court to look at page 559 five, internally, 567 of the the guard report and to consider the passage above the heading paragraph 2 which is very opaque but so far as I can unravel it might support um, the fact that uh, the Professor Lagarde um, was indicating that article 7 could apply as between a contracting state to a non-contracting state but, but unravelling that is very, very difficult, and I don't have the time now to do it. Um, I want now to turn to ground one, yes, please. So the date for the assessment of habitual residence, was it the date of the application, so that's the 24th of June, or was it the date of the um, trial, the end of November? I accept and acknowledge that um, the... There are a number of authorities, and I will simply refer to them without going to them, um, whereby judges of this division have decided that it's the date of the trial. And the court has already the, the, the problems that, that uh, derive from that. Essentially, a jurisdictional march is... So so that's just so I'm clear, when you say judges of this division, you mean judges of the family division? I'm so divisions. sorry. Um, I, I'm 
thinking of too many things at the same time. What I mean is judges of a family division. Um, there is only one court of appeal there are, um, that is engaged. So no, again, it's a, a, an issue that this court hasn't looked at. So this is the first time that the courts look, um, looked at it. And um, so the, the case against me is the case uh, put very ably by my learned friend, of course, but also uh, put by Mr. Justice MacDonald in the case that we were just looking at, the London Borough of Hackney and P and others. And I'm simply going to give the references, uh, paragraph um, 67, and in particular his discussion at paragraph 106 to 111. And he comes to a conclusion that the, the point is, um, the date of assessment is the date of the trial. In addition, again, I have to readily accept that insofar as um, our researchers have taken us, the limited number of cases that are available, particularly from Australia, and then Northern Ireland, Nor Northern Ireland, Irish case, but they have um, fallen in step with that, and again determined that it's the date of assessment is at the um, at the point of the trial. But you will see from the document, the joint document that we've provided, which is at the beginning of the authorities bundle, that there are a very limited number of cases. The argument on the point has been very limited, um, and that it's by no means a tsunami of cases against us, uh, if I can put it that way. And the Australian cases seem to uh, be fixed uh, in the domestic legislation, because it's, it's, they're not applying the convention directly, they're applying uh, the domestic law provisions. Yes. Uh, which incorporated the convention. Exactly so. Australian law. Um, and I can't put it better than that. So they're really um, interpreting the domestic uh, uh, legislation and, and not interpreting uh, the convention. But um, what I suggest is that uh, there is there is there are points that are made well made against me, and uh, Mr. Justice Macdonald probably is his case is probably the the most um, effective rebuttal of our position. And what we seek to do is to align ourselves and rely upon the decision of Miss, Mrs. Justice Lever, uh, which came out after um, the decision in this case. And, and her case is the case of Derbyshire County Council and Mother and others, and it's at page 239 of the bundle, and I think it would be helpful just briefly um, to look at that. Because she uh, readily accepts, as I do, that there is an alternative position, that her analysis with which we align ourselves is set out at paragraphs 10 to 26, that's page 244 of the authorities bundle and she deals head on with Mr Justice MacDonald's approach in the London Borough of Hackney and P and, and Mr Justice of Peel's approach in H and R. Uh, she then refers page 245 paragraph 14 to article 31 of the Vienna Convention on the, the Law of Treaties um, she refers to the Lagarde report, paragraph 16, page 247. She says that she finds the passages in the report um, opaque, and I would agree with that. Um, uh, she then um, refers back to Article 31 of the Vienna Convention. She relies on the object and purposes of the Hague Convention at paragraph 20. Um, and these are critical passages, I suggest, 
and, and they reflect the theme of the arguments that Professor George and I seek to put forward to this court. But paragraphs 21 onwards, if habitual residence, Mrs. Justice Leland says, this is page 250, paragraph 21, if habitual residence and therefore jurisdiction has to be revisited at every hearing, then that creates very significant practical difficulties, may be seriously detrimental to the interests of the child. It creates a strong incentive in abduction cases and potentially in other cases for one party to delay proceedings in order to move the child's place of habitual residence. Therefore, the jurisdiction of the court to the new country she then refers to Mr. Justice MacDonald emphasising the need for robust case management. She says robust case management in many cases will not solve the issue. In the present case, the delays are a product of the need for expert medical evidence, not any default of the parties or lack of robust case management. In this instance, in this instance, the instance we were dealing with, as was recorded in the order of Mr. Justice Peel dated the 13th of July, the delay that took place was a result of the court not being able to accommodate the case. A three-day listing, obviously, is not going to come on very quickly. Um, uh, paragraph 24, Mrs. Justice Leaven goes on to say, further delay is endemic in the system. In the interpretation of the Hague Convention, <coughs> the court's jurisdiction at the mercy of such delay uh, whether being deliberately encouraged by a party or not is an interpretation which does not advance the protection of the child. Um, and she then accepts at 25 that the thrust of the explanatory report appears to be that habitual residence and thus jurisdiction is not to be fixed when the court is seized. She says, in my view, the purpose of the Hague Convention is best met by habitual residence and therefore jurisdiction being determined when the court is seized. So we rely um, entirely for the reasons um, provided uh, on what Mrs. Justice Leaven says um, in those passages that uh, um, I have um, set out. I then want, if I may, to um, finally turn to ground two. I just, if, um, going back to the Family Law Act, if the Hague Convention doesn't apply to give jurisdiction, yes. we're back, as you pointed out, to um, Section 3 yes. and the relevant date. And yeah. so the relevant date is the date of the application. Yes. So that would, that would as I say, if, if one falls outside the jurisdictional scheme of the Hague Convention, you apply domestic law. Yes. And domestic law... Um, gives jurisdiction and continuing jurisdiction Yes. in the event of habitual residence being in England and Wales at the date of the application. But you have to go on a, quite an elaborate pro progress to get there, don't you? And, and obviously we, we've identified that this morning. Because let's say my learned friend's right and the date of assessment is at the date of the trial. So the judge essentially her focus or his focus is on all of the factual no, matters. I that, but okay. the, the fact of the matter is, in this case, we're dealing with a contracting state and a non-contracting state. Yes. And the position might be different as between the two. And so, your the argument in this case, the decision in this case, only need address contracting state, non-contracting state. That's correct. And so, I understand the the, the points you're relying on set out in this judgment. But as I say, the, the jurisdictional framework in this case is that if we fall outside the um, provisions of the Hague Convention, then it's the date of the application. Yes, thank you. Um, can I then uh, um, move to ground two, please? So that's my challenge, our challenge to the assessment um, conducted by uh, Mrs. Justice Arbuthnot in relation to habitual residence. And in a sense, one is entirely um, sympathetic to the judge because um, the judge is faced with a panoply of extra on one view, of extraordinarily um, difficult uh, jurisdictional journeys. Um, 
involving cases uh, which may be said to be pointing in different directions and with no authority to rely on from this court. Added to that, she has to undertake a, um, a factual assessment of habitual residence. And we've looked, and if we can return as part of this part of the presentation to the core bundle, we've looked at, at the judgment and I've picked out certain factual findings, but paragraph 51 is, as I've sought to emphasize, which is page 50 of the uh, judgment, is, is her conclusion on habitual residence. And that's why it's important to look at um, the direction that she gives, which is um, seems to be simply some degree of integration in a social and family environment, but also to look at the analysis that runs as part of her assessment of habitual residence from page, but from paragraph 43 to 51. And we submit that when you look at that analysis, it's very narrowly focused and it's very superficial. I mean, apart from anything else, it runs to some eight paragraphs only. Well, there's, there's, there's an attractiveness to brevity, but not at the risk of um, overlooking relevant matters. Um, but she then goes on at paragraph 52 to direct her attention to a whole range of other findings, but which follow the conclusion and her analysis um, of habitual residence. And we seek essentially to make two points about, um, well, three. Uh, the first point is the point that um, Lord Justice Moylan has picked up on already uh, at paragraph 51 and whether she's directed herself uh, properly. I need not say any more about that. The second point is we challenge her analysis uh, by saying that she didn't properly take into account or give weight to particular factors in the old life of the child. What is required, amongst other things, in an analysis of habitual residence is a comparative exercise. And whilst one is obviously focusing on the situation of the child, it, at the point that the analysis takes place, one also is required to take into account um, matters that have taken place prior to the, the present age. And the third point that we make is that a lot of the analysis under the siloed or vacuum packed part of the judgment headed consent is directly applicable to the part of the judgment that is concerned with habitual residence, but doesn't feed into the overall equation. So, um, in relation to the first point I've made, the second point, matters not brought into the overall balancing exercise. And we say where what the judge should have taken into account of and given weight to were, were the following factors, and we identify um, about six. Um, the first is that this child was physically present in the UK from birth up to March 2022, so a far greater amount of time than she had been in Zambia by November 2022. And that was that's an important feature that isn't given sufficient weight or properly referred to. Point two, this child's home and these parents' home 
And all that this child knew in her life prior to March was the stable home which the parents, and particularly the mother, had lovingly um, renovated. Um, and it really is jolly nice. Um, and this child knew that home, but importantly, this child was cared for in a shared care arrangement because the mother had fallen ill in December post the COVID vaccine and the, and the father had to step up to the plate and he was a hands-on, very hands-on parent during that time. So this, there was a, there's a, there's a, a proper distinction between the sorts of cases where you have a distant parent, potentially a father, and an obviously primary carer mother, and then the primary carer mother says, right, I'm going to travel off to Sri Lanka or India or Australia or wherever. This was a case where immediately prior to the removal, these parents were sharing the, the care of this child. The third point, although the judge refers to the connections of the mother with Zambia. In fact, the mother's connections to any country were far closer to England and Wales than they were uh, with Zambia. She'd lived in this country, as the court knows, um, since 2002, so 20 years. Her mother lived in this country her primary relationship, that with the father, was in this country um, since 2016, and she jointly owned a property, a very major property in this country. That's what um, was put in place in April uh, 2021. The fourth point we make, which the judge doesn't take into account, is the lack of pre-planning by the mother. Well, the judge makes a finding that this was for a short-term purpose, a short-term trip to see the mother's to go to the mother's father's memorial service, he having died in 2017, so the five-year memorial service. But as the court knows, the mother had left most of her clothes, her favoured dog, the £150,000 Bentley. She travelled on return tickets. There'd been no arrangements for how the father was to see the child. She'd not arranged any staff or help to assist her when she was in Zimbabwe. And in fact, they took a, a, a small amount of um, food for a short trip. So point number four, which the judge doesn't take into account, the lack of pre-planning by the mother. Point five, the intention of the mother. Well, we say that her intention was entirely unclear. She's actively contemplating a move to South Africa, and I refer to paragraphs 56, 70, and 71 of the judgment. She's in August um, 2022 discussing a, a move back to the UK if the father pays her a large sum of money. So her intentions were unclear, perhaps changing, but that affects potentially the question of um, stability, which obviously is a component part, an important component part of habitual residence. And the sixth and last point that we say, again referencing stability, which the judge doesn't give weight to and doesn't take into account in her assessment of whether this child has such stability to be regarded to be habitually resident is the very significant disruption that this child will have suffered in being separated without um, her knowing that this was going to happen from the very parent that was providing a large degree of care for her in the in the period before March. Um, 2022, and, and that, we say, is a very significant um, factor that undermines the quality of stability that is an important part of making out whether a child is habitually resident in a particular jurisdiction. 
So there we've identified as, as ably as we can uh, various factors which were not brought into account or given sufficient weight in the qualitative um, analysis, the superficial analysis that um, we say that the judge carried out. And our, our third point has been trailed or wet already in terms of our challenge, but we say that the superficiality of the analysis of habitual residence is confirmed by what the judge does, does after paragraph 52. She then embarks on an analysis that is particularly directed to Article 7, but it contains factors that are relevant to the analysis of habitual residence, but these factors, factors are siloed within the part of her judgment that is directly um, directed to Article 7. So although she may touch upon them, she doesn't bring them back because she's made her conclusions already and take them into account in the, the overall analysis that she um, undertakes and which is confirmed by virtue of her conclusion at, at paragraph 51. So that, in, in relatively short order, but I hope appropriately short order, is our challenge underground too. What do you say... Uh we should do, what you're seeking from us, in the event that um, we were to conclude the judge's analysis of habitual residence was flawed? Well, I, I don't think this court is in um, a position to undertake its own. It may be, sometimes it does. But in this case, of course, there was there was some oral evidence. And the court doesn't have transcripts of... So you um, say a rehearing? It, it would have to be a rehearing. And in relation to that, um, I ought to, just for completeness, indicate that prior to this hearing, the father did um, issue an application uh, for jurisdiction to be founded on parents patriae. Well, that's a different, yeah. So that's uh, an application that is extant and uh, not yet determined. If you're wrong about round one, if the correct date is the date of the hearing, doesn't that put you in difficulties on round two? Uh, no, I, I, I don't accept it does because of the super... I mean, I don't want in any way to be pejorative, but I use it in a neutral way, but well, it was still a super... It was entitled to be. Uh, but it was a superficial analysis. Yeah. I can see why your lordship asked the question, and in fact, my learned friends, I think, um, seek to persuade you that that is the result. But we say it's not. I mean, what is required is a is a proper analysis of relevant factors that involves, apart from anything else, a comparative um, overview of particular features that may run in um, in different directions, are likely to run in different directions. And what's clear from this analysis is that the factors all are lighted upon are really running one way. And I've tried to highlight at least six, there may be more, which are factors that have significant weight, are of sufficient quality that really needed to be put into the balance. If they had been, then I wouldn't be uh, making my complaint. And um, thank you very much, my lords. Right. Um, uh, Mr. Tyler, um, you can give us a ten-minute preview of uh, what is to come. Lord, well, yes. Well, I wonder if I could. Um, I'll start please with reference to that very final point my Lord Lord has been uh, made to Mr. Deverance, uh, which is this, if you're wrong about um, ground one, aren't you in difficulties on ground two? Uh, well, firstly, we would say um, certainly. Um, but secondly, we'll just point this out, 
if wrong about ground one, but successful on ground two, where does that take the appellant? The case is remitted, uh, and the judge of first instance will have to decide uh, where the child is officially resident at the point of uh, the measure the judge is being asked to make, which will be today or more likely X weeks or months time. Yes. Uh, and uh, without prejudging what a judge would say, we were confident at first instance that certainly by the point of that hearing, the child was officially resident in Zambia. Uh, we would be extremely confident in persuading a judge at first instance by the point of consideration of the measures uh, which uh, the appellant, uh, then the applicant, invites the judge to make uh, the child would be officially resident, uh, in which case uh, uh, question uh, what was the purpose of the exercise, which is why we frame uh, our skeleton argument in a slightly different order um, from the grounds. If I may, though, uh, I'll address the grounds not in the order that we did in our argument, nor quite in the order Mr. Devrix did, but with reference to ground one first, the Article 5 point, with reference to ground three, second, the Article 7 point, uh, and then finally, uh, ground two, the question of habitual residence and the assessment thereof. Distilling our case, as I hope I can do in the few minutes before we break, in relation to ground one, we say that the intention of the Hague Conference was absolutely clear, and there's no place in interpreting the 96 Convention to import any principle of perpetuatio fora. Um, and that must be so whether habitual residence changes as uh, by necessity it must for this to be relevant to a contracting or to a non-contracting state. Uh, we will say that that proposition is clear when one examines the wording of the Convention, uh, the process of its drafting uh, and agreement and adoption by the conference, uh, and subsequent explanation of it by the Hague Conference. Uh, and we will also say it's clear with reference to the overwhelming preponderance of authority, both in this country, uh, but also looking uh, around the world, both in and outside Brussels countries. Uh, with respect, we would disagree with Mo what is Moylan's suggestion, if it was a suggestion, that the position on Article 5 might be different if uh, habitual residence moves to a contracting as opposed to a non-contracting state. Uh, and um, if we're right about that, we'll point to the real damage that can potentially be done if this court in this country takes the decision effectively, we will say, to disregard uh, the clear strictures of the Lagarde report and effectively to find a Tuatio de Fori, because it will create, a, realistically, situations in which this court, or courts of first instance in this country, uh, purport to continue to exercise Hague 96 jurisdiction, notwithstanding that habitual residents having passed to another contracting country, those courts uh, also purport to do so. Uh, as to ground three, but the issue is actually where you have not a potential conflict between two contracting states, but between a contracting state and a non-contracting state. Well, yes. So why does the Lagarde report really care? Well, first of all, I'm not sure that it, it cares or doesn't care about anything, but it certainly sets out. Um, well, it's much less interested, surely, in the uh, potential difficulties that might arise between a contracting state and a non-contracting by definition, non-contracting states are not bound by the Convention. Well, yes, but if we're right that the interpretation of Article 5 must be consistent regardless of uh, what the second state is, contracting or not, then a decision which retains jurisdiction here, notwithstanding... Yes, that, well, that depends on your first point. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. Um, but if you're wrong on your first point, then it, the second point doesn't very much further, does it? Well, not necessarily, of course, if the court decides uh, decides the case simply with reference to move from contracting to non-contracting state, then it still um, leaves the way open to subsequent courts to say, well, uh, it must be the same for a contracting state, which, of course, the court didn't decide in this case, uh, and uh, it follows. But I'll develop it, I may, when I get to it. Well, not necessarily. In 
also you have to deal with section 2, which uh, provides for what happens if the Hague Convention doesn't apply to give jurisdiction, and then you go to section 3. Well, yes. And I thought the guard said that if you fall outside Article 5, domestic law applies. Lord, yes. Um, when I begin in earnest, as um, it were, I'll take the court um, to various explanatory matters in relation to the Convention, which um, that we say will cast light on uh, what is meant by that and suggest that um, falling outside pay doesn't simply mean um, not um, uh, jurisdiction not being conferred um, with reference to Article 5. But more, um, for sure, um, Mr. Sis Peel's um, judgment in H&R provides, we say, a, a useful analysis in relation, in fact, to the nuanced way um, in which the process has to be gone through in order to decide whether jurisdiction lies in relation to Hague, and if it doesn't, uh, in what circumstances uh, the court can apply uh, its domestic jurisdiction. Uh, as to ground three, uh, we will say that looking at the entire scheme of the Convention, uh, it was intended, uh, Article 7, it was intended to govern relations between contracting states. Um, and looking at the scheme of the Convention, uh, it only uh, deals with the question of jurisdiction um, being in a member state, a contracting state, um, in which a child is not officially resident in, or in limited circumstances present in a member state, in carefully described scenarios, uh, and we'll argue that Article 7 can't be one of those. Uh, we'll point to the fact that the obvious consequence of the meaning of Article 7 urged on the court uh, by the appellant is that rather than limit scope for international conflict, uh, to retain, to purport to retain jurisdiction in a contracting state in circumstances in which, by definition, the child's official residence has passed to a non-contracting state, uh, we would be uh, almost inevitably, in every case, creating, rather than avoiding, international conflict. Uh, so in this case, and I'll come to this later, uh, self-evidently, uh, Zambia is uh, conducting proceedings in relation to the child, accepting that her presence and official residence in that country give it grounds to do so. Uh, self-evidently, it doesn't what's been taken by the appellant, but it doesn't say because uh, a contracting party to a convention to which we are not a party uh, may think otherwise, we won't uh, exercise jurisdiction. And so if this court were also to exercise jurisdiction, to accept and exercise jurisdiction, there will by definition be uh, two different states doing so contemporaneously. Whereas the whole purpose of the 96 convention is to make sure that as between the contracting states, uh, everybody knows at any one time, because it's a holistic, self-contained uh, set of articles, everyone knows at every time which member state has uh, jurisdiction. But how, do, how do you know? I mean, um, I, I, I suppose that you're right in principle, that the, the date is the date of the hearing. Um, on, on what date? Did the English court lose jurisdiction? Uh, well, jurisdiction was lost um, on the date when the residents passed from yes. uh, England to Zambia. Now how does one tell when that is? Uh, well, on this judgment, we know that it well, was. On this judgment, if the judge is right, it, it, dis it was lost within a maximum of eight weeks, possibly a lot less. Um, but suppose that's wrong. How, do, how does one tell? Well, the, the structure of the convention is that um, it's perfectly acceptable for more than one state to consider, one contracting state, to consider it has jurisdiction. And that is why the abstention article is there. So we say the purpose of the abstention, the abstention article isn't um, as it's argued because it's required that Article 5 doesn't, in fact, preclude perpetuity of the foreigner. It exists because it's uh, perfectly conceivable that more than one state may consider or be considering whether that state has jurisdiction. Uh, for example, the um, K-1 
case of Reex that my lord just Moylan heard uh, a little over a year ago, a case in pattern relation to Article 61 of Brussels II revised, involved uh, a potential conflict between Russia and England, proceedings of Russia then what still being a, a 96 signatory. Uh, Russia, uh, considering whether it had jurisdiction, being first uh, in time seized, um, so the English court abstaining from uh, exercising jurisdiction until such time as Russia decided if it did or it didn't. So the articles altogether, as the guard says, and as I'll get the court to uh, presently, the articles in Chapter 2 taken together uh, provide for every scenario, even the scenario in which contracting states don't agree about the Witcher residence existing in X place or Y place, or the exact date um, of transfer um, of the residence between X place and Y place. Uh, I'm lords in the 50 seconds remaining in relation to um, ground two, uh, which residence, we will say this uh, was an experienced High Court judge who directed herself appropriately, uh, who heard evidence, who delivered a reasoned judgment. Yes, it was reserved in the context of the sort of lists which High Court judges must endure, um, and which then months later, as is always the case, is picked over in detail uh, in this court. Uh, we will say that it is clear that her ladyship entirely appropriately looked at the question of habitual residence by focusing on the child, uh, on the child's life, on the child's lived experience. Uh, and we'll say that judgments are necessary, necessarily linear um, and that siloing is a criticism directed really uh, more at form than content. Uh, for example, uh, paragraph 50 of the Ladyship's judgment uh, refers simply with reference to a couple of words, lack of consent, to a factor on which uh, Ladyship then expands in some detail thereafter. Uh, so, almost by definition, they're headline factors in that section that have to be taken in the context of the judge having heard the evidence uh, and of the whole of the judgment. Uh, so my lords, um, unless I can um, add any further consideration, that, that is what I'll be saying 